Throughout its history, Scotland has been the birthplace of countless remarkable individuals, their names indelibly woven into the fabric of the countries and even the world's history. Legendary figures such as Robert the Bruce, Sir William Wallace, Flora MacDonald and Bonnie Dundee have been instrumental in crafting the romanticised essence of Scotland. The actions, some noble, some flawed, of these iconic figures persist in today's collective consciousness, weaving a vibrant narrative of Scotland's past that consistently moulds and captivates our contemporary perception of the nation. For every great Scot, there are those who are not so well known, but who've played an almost equally pivotal part in shaping the country into what we know now. Alongside King Robert the Bruce stood Sir James Douglas, also known as Good Sir James or the Black Douglas, he was a close and loyal companion of Robert during the Scottish Wars of Independence. Sir William Wallace and Scottish Knight Andrew de Maury forged a formidable alliance during the early chapters of the First War of Scottish Independence. Their collaboration bore fruit in significant triumphs, most notably at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297. United in purpose, Wallace and Maury played pivotal roles in the fight against the English dominance, etching their names into the annals of Scottish history. Bonnie Dundee led his Jacobite army into battle at Killycranky, alongside Sir Ewan Cameron of Lochiel. Born in 1629 at Kilhurn Castle on the banks of Loch Awe, Sir Ewan was a notable Scottish clan chief recognised for his steadfast loyalty and strategic acumen. Notably, he earned the moniker the Ulysses of the Highlands for his remarkable military acumen. His daring exploits, including the infamous throat bite incident during single combat at the Battle of Inverlochy in 1645, have earned him a place in history. The Camerons were strong supporters of the Royal Stuarts and took up arms to support various causes, solidifying their legacy as stalwart defenders of the Jacobite cause. Sir Ewan was said to be an imposing figure and described as having a Spanish countenance with flashing eyes and a moustache curled as the moon's horns. Cameron is also believed to be the man who killed the last wolf in Scotland in 1680 at Killycranky. And it's here, nine years later, that her story unfolds. As tensions simmered in Scotland, the political landscape was a powder keg ready to explode. The late 17th century witnessed a fervent struggle for power and religious freedom. The Jacobite cause, rallying behind the exiled Stuart monarchs, sought to overturn the Protestant ascendancy. The looming Battle of Killycranky on July the 27th, 1689, became a pivotal moment in this turbulent saga. The clash unfolded against the backdrop of the Glorious Revolution and the Williamite War in Ireland, both of which heightened the stakes for the Jacobites in Scotland. Bonnie Dundee, also known as John Graham of Claverhouse, Viscount Dundee, emerged as a charismatic and daring leader. A staunch supporter of the Stuart cause, he rallied the Jacobite forces with fervour. Dundee's call to arms echoed through the glens as he gathered supporters from far and wide to challenge the Protestant Williamite government. The Cameron clan, under the leadership of Sir Ewan Cameron, devoted Jacobites, lent their strength to the cause. As the political landscape convulsed, alliances were forged and loyalties tested. The lush hills surrounding Killycranky bore witness to the gathering storm. The strategic significance of the pass made it a natural battleground, and both sides prepared for a clash that would reverberate through history. Amidst the whispers of rebellion, Sir Ewan Cameron's leadership stood out. His military expertise and unyielding commitment to the cause earned him respect among Jacobite ranks. The events leading up to the battle were a tapestry of political intrigue, military manoeuvres and a palpable sense of destiny. As the sun dipped below the horizon on that fateful day, the forces converged, setting the stage for the Battle of Killigranke. 
The first tingling that this battle may be like no other before it may have occurred the night before the fighting happened. As the Jacobites sheltered, doing what they could to take their mind off the inevitable carnage that would unfold the next day, Dundee retired to his tent and soon fell soundly asleep. His rest was interrupted by an unexpected visitor, a man with blood streaming from his head, standing by his bedside. Dundee woke with a start and sat bolt upright in his bed, fully expecting to have to challenge a nocturnal intruder, but the mysterious figure had vanished. Convinced it was a mere illusion, Dundee eventually settled back down and fell asleep. Yet again the strange guest returned, pointing this time to his wounded head, blood streaming from the injury, and beckoning Dundee to accompany him. Once again Dundee awoke, and again found his tent empty. This time, instead of ignoring the sighting, he decided to inquire with a sentry posted at the entrance to see if there had been any intruders during his sleep. The sentry reported no one had entered, so Dundee again dismissed the matter and tried to go back to sleep. Yet his slumber was far from peaceful. The bloodied apparition returned, persistently prompting Dundee to rise, the spirit pointed in the direction of Killycranky and spoke, telling Dundee the ominous warning that he would meet, meet him there. Following this unnerving encounter, Dundee decided to get up and discuss the peculiar visitation with a Highland chief. Could this visitor have foreshadowed events that would unfold during the battle? As the light faded on Killycranky, the battle erupted with a ferocity that mirrored the fervent tensions of the time. The haunting war cries of Alaba Gubra reverberated through the dense forest, sending a shiver down the spines of the redcoat soldiers. In the face of this unseen menace, a palpable panic gripped them, forcing them to hastily organise into a defensive line three men deep. The government forces fired three rounds of musket shots, killing close to 600 Jacobites, nearly a quarter of their entire force. After the Redcoats' initial action, silence again fell on a field, before a short volley of musket fire sounded from the trees where the rest of the Jacobite forces had taken cover. Then Bonnie Dundee gave the signal for the famous Highland Charge, and hundreds of Jacobite warriors burst forward from their hiding places, charging headlong toward the brittle redcoat line. Dundee's and Cameron's troops covered the distance in the blink of an eye and were on the alarmed government troops in seconds. The sound of muskets was replaced with the clash of steel and the cries of the wounded and dying, painting a vivid picture of the brutality of 17th century warfare. The fighting was intense, with both sides locked in a struggle for supremacy. In the midst of the chaos, Sir Ewan Cameron's leadership shone. His tactical brilliance and unwavering resolve bolstered the Jacobite forces. The Cameron clan fought valiantly, their loyalty to the Stuart cause evident in every skirmish. It soon became clear that the Jacobites, despite being badly outnumbered, had won the day many redcoat soldiers began to flee the battlefield. Some were cut down by the ferocious Jacobites as they ran. Some managed to escape, and one, Donald McBain, would need an almost superhuman surge of resilience and resourcefulness to avoid capture or death at the hands of a Highlander. Chased relentlessly, McBain found himself trapped. He had the River Gary in front of him and Jacobites quickly approaching. To cross the Gary, he'd have to make an almost unthinkable leap of faith across the 18-foot waterfall that's now known as the Soldier's Leap. And this he did, losing a shoe, his buckle and a sword on the way. As the battle raged, tragedy struck. In the midst of fierce fighting, Dundee rallied his troops. As he raised his left arm, a musket ball from a redcoat sniper found its mark and he succumbed in the thick of the fighting. Although his death was a blow to the Jacobite cause, it didn't extinguish the flames of rebellion. The Jacobite cause, while celebrating the victory, grappled with the absence of its inspirational leader 
and was never able to fully recover from the loss. The government forces too faced the sobering reality of the challenges posed by the Jacobite uprising. The lush hills, once witness to the clash of ideologies, stood silent, carrying the echoes of a battle that reverberated through time. The land would also bear witness to the haunting aftermath of this violent clash, and the spirits of those who fell in the Battle of Kilikranki would linger, their presence felt in the chilling whispers that danced through the winds of the historic pass. The following account is taken from the 1911 book Scottish Ghosts by Elliot O'Donnell. Many are the stories that have from time to time been circulated with regard to the haunting of the pass of Kilikranki by phantom soldiers. But I do not think there is any stranger story than that related to me some years ago by a lady who declared she had actually witnessed the phenomena. Her account of it I shall reproduce as far as possible in her own words. Let me commence by stating that I am not a spiritualist, neither do I lay any claim to mediumistic powers. Indeed, I have always regarded the term medium with the gravest of suspicion. I am, on the contrary, a plain, practical, matter-of-fact woman, and with the exception of this one occasion, never witnessed any psychical phenomena. The incident I'm about to relate took place the autumn before last. I was on a cycle tour in Scotland and, making Pitlochry my temporary headquarters, rode over one evening to view the historic Pass of Kilikranki. It was late when I arrived there, and the western sky was one great splash of crimson and gold, such vivid colouring I had never seen before, and never have since. Indeed, I was so entranced at the sublimity of the spectacle that I perched myself on a rock at one foot of the great cliffs that form the walls of the pass, and throwing my head back, imagined myself in fairyland. Lost thus in a delicious luxury, I paid no heed to the time, nor did I think of stirring until the dark shadows of the night fell across my face. I then started up in a panic and was about to pedal off in hot haste when a strange notion suddenly seized me. I had a latch key, plenty of sandwiches, a warm cape. Why should I not camp out there till early morning? I had long yearned to spend the night in the open. Now was my opportunity. The idea was no sooner conceived than put into operation. Selecting the most comfortable looking boulder I could see, I scrambled on the top of it, and with my cloak drawn tightly over my back and shoulders, I commenced my vigil. The cold mountain air, sweet with the perfume of gorse and heather, intoxicated me, and I gradually sank into a heavenly torpor, from which I was abruptly aroused by a dull boom, that I all at once associated with distant musketry. All was then still, still as the grave, and on glancing at the watch I wore strapped on my wrist, I saw it was 2am. A species of nervous dread now laid hold of me, and a thousand and one vague fancies, all the more distressing because of their vagueness, oppressed and disconcerted me. Moreover, I was impressed for the first time of the extraordinary solitude, solitude that seemed to belong a period far other than the present, and as I glanced around at the solitary pines and gleaming boulders, I more than half expected to see the wild, ferocious face of some robber chief, some fierce yet fascinating hero of Sir Walter Scott's, peering at me from behind them. This feeling at length became so acute that, in a panic of fear, ridiculous, puerile fear, I forcibly withdrew my gaze and concentrated it abstractly on the ground at my feet. I then listened and in the rustling of a leaf, the humming of some night insect, the whizzing of a bat, the whispering of the wind as it moaned softly past me, I fancied, nay, I felt sure I detected something that was not ordinary. I blew my nose and had barely ceased marvelling at the loudness of its reverberations before the piercing, ghoulish shriek of an owl sent the blood in torrents to my heart. I then laughed and my blood froze as I heard a chorus of what I tried to persuade myself could only be echoes proceed from every crag and rock in the valley. For some seconds after this I sat still, hardly daring to breathe, 
and pretending to be extremely angry with myself for being such a fool. With a stupendous effort, I turned my attention to the most material of things. One of the skirt buttons on my hip, they were much in vogue then, being loose. I endeavoured to occupy myself in tightening it, and when I could no longer derive any employment from that, I set to work on my shoes and tied knots in the laces, merely to enjoy the task of untying them. But this, too, ceasing at last to attract me, I was desperately racking my mind for some other device, when there came again the queer, booming noise I had heard before, but which I could no longer doubt was the report of firearms. I looked in the direction of the sound, and my heart almost stopped. Racing towards me, as if not merely for his life, but his soul, came the figure of a Highlander. The wind rustling through his long, dishevelled hair blew it completely over his forehead, narrowly missing his eyes, which were fixed ahead of him in a ghastly, agonised stare. He had not a vestige of colour, and in the powerful glow of the moonbeams, his skin shone livid. He ran with huge bounds, and what added to my terror and made me double aware he was nothing mortal was that each time his feet struck the hard, smooth road upon which I could well see there was no sign of a stone, there came the sound, the unmistakable sound of the scattering of gravel. On, on he came, with cyclonic swiftness, his bare sweating elbows pressed into his panting sides, his great, dirty, coarse, hairy fists screwed up in bony bunches in front of him, the foam flakes thick on his clenched, grinning lips, the blood drops oozing down his sweating thighs. It was all real, infernally, hideously real, even to the most minute details, the flying up and down of his kilt sporran and swordless scabbard, the bursting of the seam of his coat near the shoulder, and the absence of one of his clumsy shoe buckles. I tried hard to shut my eyes, but was compelled to keep them open and follow his every movement, as, darting past me, he left the roadway, and leaping several of the smaller obstacles that barred his way, finally disappeared behind some of the bigger boulders. I then heard the loud rat-tat-tat of drums, accompanied by the shrill voices of fifes and flutes, and at the farther end of the pass, their arms glittering brightly in the silvery moonbeams, appeared a regiment of scarlet-clad soldiers. At the head rode a mounted officer. After him came the band, and then, four abreast, a long line of warriors. In their centre, two ensigns, and on their flanks, officers and non-commissioned officers with swords and pikes, more mounted men bringing up the rear. On they came, the fifes and flutes ringing out with a weird clearness in the hushed mountain air. I could feel the ground vibrate beneath me, the gravel crunching and scattering under the steady and mechanical advance of the soldiers. Tall men, towering figures with set white faces and livid eyes. Every moment I anticipated their gaze falling upon me, and the thought of meeting those pale, flashing eyes filled me with a sickening dread. Fortunately, I remained unnoticed. They passed by without so much as a twist or turn of the head, their feet keeping time to an everlasting and monotonous tramp, tramp, tramp. I rose and watched until the last of them disappeared around the bend of the pass, the sheen of their weapons and trappings fading from sight. As the moonbeams cast a peculiar witness blending with the surroundings, the entire scene took an indescribably dreary and ghostly aspect. Feeling cold and hungry, I set about unwrapping my beef sandwiches, meticulously separating the fat from the lean, a peculiar habit of mine. Suddenly, a loud rustling interrupted my solitude. Across the road, a tree, an ash, swayed violently, despite the stillness of the air, emitting dreadful moans and groans. Terrified, I grasped my bicycle, attempting to mount, but found myself devoid of strength. To assure myself of the reality of the moving tree, I rubbed my eyes, pinched myself, called aloud, yet the rustling, bending and tossing continued unabated. Summoning courage, I stepped into the road for a closer look. To my horror, my feet kicked against something, and looking down, I beheld the body of an English soldier, a ghastly wound gaping in his chest. 
Surrounding me in every direction lay the bodies of men and horses, Highlanders and English, with white-cheeked, lurid eyes and bloody brows, a ghastly tableau of death. As I stood, frozen with horror, unsure of where to look or turn, a woman, a Highland girl, dropped from the ash tree. With bold, handsome features and raven-black hair, she carried a wicker basket in one hand and a broad-bladed, sharp-edged, horn-handled knife in the other. A gleam of avarice and cruelty flickered in her large, dark eyes as she surveyed the fallen soldiers. Forgetful she was but a ghost, and they're all ghosts, I attempted to intervene, to no avail. With devilish glee, she plunged her knife into the heart of a wounded officer, methodically stripping him of his belongings. Her acts of cruelty, both varied and macabre, held me transfixed in terror. As she turned her gaze towards me, a shriek of rage pierced the air. And she rushed towards me, her blade raised high. Overwhelmed, I succumbed to darkness, only to awaken to the cheerful freshness of the early morning sun. The phantoms vanished, leaving the pass bathed in its serene beauty. Unscathed by the ordeal, I swiftly cycled home, savouring the simple joys of a night spent amid the banks and braes of Bonnie Scotland. She's not the only person to have witnessed spectral activity on the battlefield. Other visitors have recounted occasions where they've been surrounded by the ghosts of dead redcoat soldiers, and others also report hearing the unmistakable sound of a phantom regiment marching across a long-disappeared gravel track. For centuries, those who go to the site on the evening of the 27th, the eve of the battle, report witnessing ghostly echoes of the historic conflict. The grass in the area where fallen soldiers are believed to have perished is said to take on a crimson hue, and anyone bold enough to touch it finds themselves marked by a sticky residue similar to blood, proving it's not a trick of the light. As the sun sets behind the hills of Killycrankie, the echoes of the past continue to linger, casting a haunting shadow upon this historic battleground. The events of that day, where Jacobites clashed with redcoats, have left an indelible mark on the landscape and the pages of Scottish history. The battlefield, once stained with the blood of warriors, now resonates with spectral whispers. For those who venture into the pass, the very air seems to carry the weight of a bygone conflict. The phantoms of Highlanders and Redcoats alike still march in unseen formations, their spectral presence haunting the imagination of those who dare to tread upon this hallowed ground after sundown. In the quietude of night, especially on the eve of the 27th, when the veil between the living and the departed is said to thin, the past comes alive. Witnesses have described ghostly apparitions, the phantom sounds of musket fire, and the chilling cries of soldiers lost to time. Kiligranke, with its serene beauty under the morning sun, hides the spectral secrets of its past. As the day turns to dusk and shadows lengthen in the historic pass, one can't help but wonder what unseen forces linger in the quiet corners and what restless spirits still march in the ghostly cadence of a long-forgotten conflict. The haunting of Kiligranke endures, leaving us to ponder the mysteries that echo through time.